Thank you for taking this first step in becoming part of our Housing Ready Communities Initiative. My name is Robert Stromberg, you can call me Bob, and I work with Destination Home, a nonprofit organization working to prevent and end homelessness in Santa Clara County. And this presentation is to answer some of your questions and to invite you to become a part of Housing Ready Communities. We hope that you'll sign up and join our action network, and that we also share this information with your neighbors, coworkers, friends, and neighborhood leaders. So let's get started. First of all, we always start with this slide. We start with this slide to make sure that you understand that this is not a slogan. Housing ends homelessness, and we know this. The initiative is called Housing Ready Communities because about 10 or 15 years ago, in this country, we dealt with homelessness using a housing ready approach. And the housing ready approach meant that I, Bob, who live outside, I am homeless. In order to have a conversation about housing, first I need to fix all of the problems that I have, be that with physical health or mental health or addiction or you name it. And after I've become housing ready, you'll have a conversation with me about housing. But about 20 years ago in New York City, an experiment was put into place. And that experiment was, what if we flip that strategy on its head and provide housing first with the services that people need and see if it's any more successful at ending homelessness for people? And it turned out that it was incredibly successful. As a result, and based on the reality here in Santa Clara County and the Bay Area and throughout California, we know that it's not Bob who's homeless who needs to be housing ready. It's the rest of us who already live in homes and neighborhoods. And that's why this initiative is called Housing Ready Communities. And we hope that you'll join us. So what does this presentation consist of? First of all, we're gonna talk about awareness. Awareness of some of the things that you already know. So we have a homelessness crisis, we have a housing crisis, and what are some of the details about that? The second piece is understanding. There's some data and facts that you might not be aware of that will help change the way that you view homelessness and how we're addressing it, and also help you understand how you can participate. And that leads to the third part of the presentation, which is action. That the only way we can move forward with proven solutions to end homelessness is with your participation. And we hope you will get involved directly. So you look closely. First, we're gonna talk about the homelessness crisis. What does that mean? Going to spend a little bit of time on the diversity of people experiencing homelessness. Then we're going to move to the housing crisis and take a little bit of a look at about how the housing crisis impacts different people differently. Then we're going to look at some evidence about what is this proven solution to homelessness that we've discovered. There's another piece that we're going to fit in there after that that's about the cost of managing homelessness. So what is it costing our community today to deal with homelessness? Finally, we're going to look at progress toward the proven solution that's already being achieved and some of the benefits that this new kind of housing can bring to your neighborhood. And then we're going to close with, again, the action piece about how you can get involved and give you some concrete steps to take to be a part of our action network to end homelessness. This map I always show because it helps to demonstrate that we're dealing with a regional problem. Homelessness in our community is not something that is only being faced in downtown San Jose or in your city. It's something that we're facing as a region. And what that means is we need to work on it together. Only with collective solutions and collective impact together can we address homelessness. Let's say, for example, that we put a wall around one of our cities and forbid any people from living there who don't have homes. What do you think would be the impact on the cities on the outside of that wall? So we need to solve it together. It's not to throw stones at any one particular community, it's to recognize that we need to address this together. Now a little bit about the diversity of the homeless population in Santa Clara County. I'm relatively new to Santa Clara County. I moved here about two and a half years ago and I had never seen homelessness like it is here. When I first moved here, I lived in downtown San Jose on the south side of downtown and I worked on the north side of downtown. And every day I would walk 10 or 15 minutes from my apartment to my job. And I would walk past 10, 15, 20 different homeless individuals and none of them were families with children. And I didn't know if any of them were veterans. 
And I couldn't tell if anyone had been a victim of domestic violence or had lost their job. All I saw were people suffering. And I started to develop a preconceived notion about what the entire homelessness population consists of. But a lot of those preconceived notions simply were not true. Another fact, for example, 83%, according to the most recent completed survey, of those who are homeless in our county lived in a home here before losing that home. So just like I moved here from somewhere else, some folks without homes do as well, but the vast majority were our neighbors before losing their homes. Another really important statistic to remember is this 41%. 41% of those who are homeless today are homeless for the very first time. Now, that's certainly contrasted with what my perception of, of those 15 or 20 individuals I walked past on my way to work when I first moved here. It seemed to me that they had probably been homeless for many years. And in fact, some of those in our community who live without a home have been homeless for many years. But the chronic homelessness population, that is those who have been homeless multiple times or for multiple years and have some sort of disabling condition, really makes up about 20 or 25 percent of the total population. In fact, 64 percent of those who are homeless in our community have been homeless for less than one year. And 77 percent have been homeless for less than two years. So that means that we do have a significant population, 20, 25 percent, who are chronically homeless and have been homeless for a long time and have serious service needs. However, the vast majority are homeless for much shorter periods of time and need different kinds of services and help in order to end their homelessness. This next slide is one that we leave intentionally blank. And the slide is left blank for two reasons. The first reason is to remind us that we're talking about real people. You'll see in this entire presentation that the only face that you see is mine. But the faces of homelessness in our community are vast and diverse, and they look a lot like me and a lot like you. So we shouldn't forget that we're talking about real people with real names who are our neighbors. The second reason that this slide is blank is something that Destination Home is taking a serious look at looking forward in the next few years. And that is that in terms of race equity, our homelessness population demonstrates some problems with our systems of care. For example, in Santa Clara County, the total African-American population is about 2% of the total. So among the general population. Among our homeless residents, guess what percentage are African-American? 16%. So in other words, if you're black in Santa Clara County, you're eight times more likely to enter homelessness than your white counterpart. And similar problems exist for other racial and ethnic minorities in our community. This doesn't necessarily have to do with our homelessness system of care, but it does have to do with how people fall into homelessness. What are the historical and current reasons that those of color are more likely to enter homelessness than others? We're gonna be looking at what those reasons might be and how to address it to prevent that going forward. Now, on to the hard part. So, housing crisis. Who knows that we have a housing crisis? It's on the front page every day, right? The legislature was considering 200 bills related to housing this year. So a housing crisis has become a kitchen table conversation for many of us. Whether it's because your kids who are graduating from college have no ability to pay for rent or to much less purchase a home in this community, or because of friends of yours who've recently left to go live somewhere that's more affordable. The housing crisis impacts nearly all of us. However, we do wanna take a minute to draw a little bit of a distinction between how the housing crisis impacts different income groups. So this slide is quite possibly the most complex in the entire presentation. You'll see we have two rows. The rows are planning cycles for the region. The little numbers under the percents indicate goals per income group for the entire county. So for example, for extremely and very low income affordable housing, that's affordable housing that families earning $65,000 or less can afford, in the last planning cycle, 2007 to 2014, our community only produced 27% of
of the projected need. Now, if you move all the way to the right-hand side of that row, you'll see 139%. And that's the percentage of projected homes that we needed at market rate. So people can afford to pay what is demanded on the market with no income restrictions whatsoever. Now, there are market reasons for that. And in recent years, where market rate apartments, particularly new ones, have been able to increase rents 8, 9, 12, 15 percent every single year, it was pretty easy for them to convince a bank to give them the money to develop the housing. So there are market reasons why we surpass our market rate goals. On the other hand, for extremely and very low income housing, that housing is incredibly expensive to produce. The rents are restricted so that they remain affordable for folks with incomes in that category, and therefore they're more difficult to finance. It requires investment from the county, from the city that it's taking place in, from private investors, and sometimes also from the state, not to mention the federal government that provides housing vouchers to help subsidize those rents for those families. So there are a lot more actors involved, and there are a lot of obstacles to creating the housing. So that being said, why am I showing you this slide? Some housing is easier to produce than others. I'm showing you this because we know that those who are falling into homelessness come from these lowest income groups predominantly. And if we're gonna prevent future homelessness, we need to focus to prioritize development of housing that is affordable for folks with lowest incomes in our community. Just as one other anecdotal piece of evidence, every month in our county right now, we as a system move 50, 60, 100 people from living outside into a home with supportive services. That's a fantastic number and is tremendous success when you compare to what we were doing four or five years ago. However, in that same month where we move this 100 people into housing, 300 people lose their homes and enter homelessness. Therefore, even if we're able to provide supportive housing for everyone who's living outside, we're gonna have three times that number of new homeless individuals in our community. How do we prevent that? By producing extremely low income and very low income housing, or otherwise referred to as ELI, VLI, affordable housing. The next slide demonstrates just how tight things can get for someone in that very lowest income group. In our county, it's estimated there are more than 65,000, it's probably a conservative estimate, renter families in this group. So families earning less than $40,000 a year. Of those 65,000, 70% of them, or 45,000, are paying more than half of their take-home pay in rent. So let's put that into real terms. What that means is at the top end of the spectrum, and remember people are making much less, families are bringing home $2,500, $2,600. Their rent is $1,300 or $1,400 or $1,500. Now, do a little simple math and it's easy to see that you've left a family with $800 or $700 or $600 after they pay rent for everything else they need to do in that month. So whether it's groceries or health expenses, not to mention a dinner out or a vacation, quickly become impossible, particularly when faced with any kind of disaster or emergency. If you break your leg, if there's a divorce or a separation, if you lose income from one of the income earners in the family, it becomes very easy to see that you'll be unable to meet that rent obligation. For me, and I'm sure many of you can agree, if I lost my job because I made a really horrible video about housing ready communities, then I could probably stay in my home for a month or two. But after that, I would probably have to move out and move in with my cousin or move out and ask one of my friends to let me sleep on their sofa or in their second bedroom if they have one. Now, if I didn't have any of those networks, if I didn't have those family connections, then I would have to leave town or live outside. And that's the case for thousands, tens of thousands of our neighbors throughout Santa Clara County. Again, reason to focus, to prioritize development of housing for these lowest income groups. 
So, supportive housing. We said at the beginning, housing ends homelessness. So what is this supportive housing? I started this work two and a half years ago and had not worked on homelessness or housing before. My experience is in community engagement and advocacy and policy, but I didn't know what supportive housing was. And it comes across as this sort of like magic spell, a mystery, but it's not. Supportive housing is just housing with supportive services. And this graphic we developed in order to help sort of demystify what those services are. Now, they're the obvious things that you might think of. We're talking about individuals who have some sort of disabling condition and need services and support. And a lot of times that means physical health, mental health, and addiction recovery. Those are sort of the ones that people think of most immediately. But it also means help with employment for those who are able to go back to work. It also means family reunification. Just as my example, I would move in with my cousin. If I didn't have him, then I probably wouldn't have anywhere to go. So if you're disconnected from your family, you're much less well prepared to deal with an emergency and prevent homelessness. Another is just the engagement with the community. People need meaningful daily activities and they need some way to engage with their community, just like you and I do. That's supportive housing. The housing first approach really just says the housing has to come first with the services in order for it to be successful. And I'm sure that you can imagine that if you were living outside and you had nowhere to shower and you had nowhere to prepare your resume and you had nowhere to keep your belongings, it would be pretty difficult to be successful in the professional world. The same applies to everyone else in our community. That's why the housing first approach works. So I say it works. I told you it works at the beginning. I just told you again, who wants to guess how successful it is? You might think it's 10% successful, 50%. Of all those individuals who are homeless and then are moved into permanent supportive housing, what percent of those remain stably housed one year later? 90%. Now this is a phenomenal success rate compared with any other intervention to end homelessness. The comparison that I always make, and I wanna put a caveat on it, is with shelters. We need shelters for temporary relief and support and safety for people who are homeless. Without a doubt, we need shelters in our community. But what do you think the success rate of ending homelessness is for a shelter? Typically, it's between 10 and 15%. Now, a shelter has a lot more obstacles in order to end someone's homelessness. If we don't have the housing for people to move into, then how could a shelter possibly end that homelessness? And that brings us back to the primary goal of housing ready communities, and that is we need more supportive housing. 90% success is the number here in Santa Clara County. Kind of varies up and down, 93%, 89% but it's also the number across the country. You look at any city around the country and around the world, and it's 85%, 95%. Tremendously successful. This can also be seen from our original pilot. It was called Housing 1000, where we moved the first 1000 individuals from homelessness into supportive housing. And this graph shows the zero line in the middle. That's when each of those 1000 moved from living outside into supportive housing. In each of the little dots that make up those graphs, those bars, those are a utilization, a use of a public service. So it might be engagement with law enforcement, it might be engagement with medical health services, it might be engagement with mental health services, all kinds of public services that, that are provided for people experiencing homelessness. And what you see in this graph is a dramatic drop off in the use of those services simply because you've moved someone into housing. Now, it doesn't mean that, Bob, I'm homeless, and then I moved into supportive housing, and whatever physical or mental or other issues that I had simply go away. It just means that I need fewer services in order to overcome them. You provide those services inside the building with me, so I have a much better opportunity to advance and to heal. Not to mention the calm and rest and safety of having a home. Now, this kind of success and these additional services point us to a very large number, $520 million. This came from a study that Destination Home commissioned four years ago called Home Not Found. 
And this was really trying to look at what is the cost of managing homelessness today. And so we looked at services provided by the County of Santa Clara, so excluding city services, excluding private nonprofit services that are funded by outside donors, just looking at county services. And those services cost our community more than $500 million every single year. And that doesn't include any housing. That's just the cost of managing homelessness. And this number led us to a much larger number in order to meet the goals of the community plan to end homelessness. Now the community plan to end homelessness was put into place in 2015 in order to bring together stakeholders throughout the community so we can hold each other accountable and meet the goals that we need to in order to end homelessness in Santa Clara County. And the primary goal of that plan is to create 6,000 housing opportunities, 6,000 supportive housing homes for those who need them most. And as you can see, in just those four short years, we have accomplished quite a bit. In 2015, there were fewer than 400 supportive housing opportunities, homes with supportive services in the entire county. Today, we're getting close to 2,500. Now that includes some existing homes and apartments that have the services added on, we call that scatter site supportive housing, and it includes new construction of some new supportive housing apartment buildings where we can provide more intensive services on site. So we're making a lot of progress and we need to keep going. A billion dollars is the bigger number that I was gonna point to. A billion dollars is almost rounding up the amount of the 2016 Measure A affordable housing bond. Thanks to you, the Santa Clara County voters, we approved $950 million 700 million of which goes exclusively to affordable housing for these lowest income groups and supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. So far, the housing bond has created more than 1,400 new housing opportunities that are in the pipeline, under construction, and ready to open. That means 19 different housing developments in six cities throughout the community. This map shows all the supportive housing opportunities throughout the entire county. So it includes those 19 new developments, but also includes all of the other supportive housing that's available. These scatter site supportive housing opportunities that are now in 11 of our 15 cities. So we're doing a pretty good job of making sure that supportive housing is available throughout the community. We can do better and we want to make sure that all neighborhoods where development makes sense are moving forward with new supportive and extremely low income affordable housing. But we're making a lot of progress and we look forward to counting on your support to push forward more new developments. I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about what are these developments. So we went over what supportive housing is, but what's it look like? I know that many people in community when I talk to them are often afraid that we're talking about attracting new homeless individuals to a community that already feels the impacts of homelessness on their streets. And I wanna reassure you that that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the development of beautiful new apartment buildings with services on site in order to help people end their homelessness forever. This example is currently under construction, hopefully will open later this year. It's called Villas on the Park and it includes 84 supportive housing units, all dedicated to those who have experienced chronic homelessness. So high service need, 100% of those homes will be for folks who formerly experienced homelessness. And there'll be a service team on site in that development. Another example is one in Milpitas. I think it's not yet under construction, but coming soon. And this is a different model. So this isn't 100% formerly homeless. This one is one third for those formerly experiencing homelessness. And then the remainder are these lowest income groups. So extremely low income, very low income, affordable housing in order to prevent homelessness in our community. And this final example is a third model, which is 50% supportive housing, and then 50% lowest income affordable housing. And this one is also in San Jose. You learned about what is the homelessness crisis and the housing crisis. You learned some new data to increase your understanding about what it is and what the solution is. And you know that you can participate. So how? 
So there are a few different ways. The first thing and the most important thing is to sign up. So you go to housingready.org and you sign up today. And that gets you on our email list so that you receive progress updates about what's going on, but also action alerts about how to participate. An example of that might be that there is a new policy before a city council about prioritizing extremely low income housing so we can get the housing that we need to prevent homelessness. Well, we wanna make sure that everyone in our community is writing letters to that city council to make sure that they do that prioritization and that they increase the percentage of that priority. Another example could be about a specific development in one of our cities. So if there's a supportive housing or an extremely low income affordable housing development being proposed, we wanna make sure that our city councils know that it's important to approve these developments and to move them forward as quickly as possible as people are outside suffering right now. So those are just two examples of action opportunities. Other ways to get involved are to check out the calendar on our website. This provides educational opportunities for you to get out and learn more. We'll also be posting notices when there is a community meeting and we need supporters to attend to help make sure that city officials and local government officials, but also your neighbors, understand the importance of this kind of housing to help us end homelessness and to demystify what supportive housing is and to debunk some of the myths that circulate about homelessness in our community. Another way for you to get involved is to get in touch with us directly. So you'll see my email address on this last slide, and that's an invitation to let us know that you'd like us to come out to your neighborhood association, or maybe your church has a faith and justice group that would like to learn more about it. We would love to come out and answer your questions and engage you in this work. There are many other ways to get involved. We'll be developing a neighborhood ambassador program that will be a monthly training opportunity for people to learn more about political activism and working for the housing that we need to prevent and end homelessness. There are ways to sign up for that on the website, or you can just contact me directly to let me know that you're interested. Thank you for your time. Please do share this with your friends, with your networks, invite others to participate. And I look forward to seeing you at the next Housing Ready Communities Action Network event. Thank you.